Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you have joined us today. My name is Kim Case, and I'm pleased to co-host today with Peggy George. Lorna um, is away attending a, a funeral today, and so we're, we will miss her. And we're glad that Peggy is back joining us today as well. And we want to welcome our very special guest, Karen Janowski, who's going to be talking today about reaching all learners, assistive technology, and tips and tricks that work. And how many in the group today are new to using Illuminate and being a participant in an Illuminate session? If you're new, if you could click on that green check just below the participants window, if you're new. Great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to briefly go over how to use Illuminate and the features that we will be using today. This is your participants window. Just below the participants window is a hand with a green up arrow. And if you'd like to take the mic at, at during our question and answer time, you can click on that to let us know, and we'll give you the, the mic. There's some emoticons just to the right of the hand. And in the very far right is a blue door. If you need to step away, you would click that to let us know that you're not at your computer. That's not how you exit the session. To exit the session at the end, you can click on the X in the top right corner or go to File Exit on a PC. And on a Mac, you click on Quit on Illuminate Live and then select Quit the Session. These are your polling features. And we will be asking some polling questions. And you have the option to use the green check or red X uh, for yes and no today. Just below the participants window is the chat window. And most of you have already found that today. You'll click, you'll type your message, and then click send making sure that the words this room are visible. If you wanted to send a private message to the moderators or to a specific person, you would just click on the drop down arrow and then click send. In the far left is the talk button during the Q&A time if you're going to use your microphone. We do recommend that you have a USB headset so that you can make sure that your audio is clear and there aren't any uh, echoing. But you will click that mic button to begin speaking. And then you'll click the mic button to turn it off and release the mic back to the room. These are the whiteboard tools. And the one that we'll be focusing on today is the laser pointer. And that's the blue one with a little red starburst. And so uh, you should be seeing those now. And we'll be using those in just a bit. We probably won't be using application sharing, but in the event that we do, you can scale it to fit by clicking on Tools, going up to Application Sharing, and then Scale to Fit. We also have Tammy Moore today doing our closed captioning features. And you can click on the CC up here at the top if you'd like to view those closed captioning texts. Uh, you can also let your colleagues know that if they would like to attend the session and they're hearing impaired, they're able to participate completely using the CC. And we thank Tammy Moore each week for volunteering to do that for us. And we have also begun using the live binders for compiling all of our links instead of the GLAM links. We feel like the live binders offer some additional great features. I'm going to go ahead and load that and briefly show you the ones that I'm talking about. Let me get that link. And it, the live binders will be the same link every week. We're just compiling each week's into one long big binder. And I'll give it a second to load on your computer. And once it loads, you'll notice that there are different tabs at the top. And each 
we, we've created a tab. And if you click on the February the 19th tab, you'll see the resources for today. And you can click on the tabs in the window. But each week has the past results uh, resources that we've shared. So be sure to to go through and explore those whenever you have time. All of our sessions are recorded and we post them to our to our website at live.classroom20.com and they're all posted on the archives and resources page. So anytime that you miss a session or you'd like to go back and review the recording or share the recording with your colleagues, then please do so and you can go back to this link anytime that you would like to review our archives. So right now, we'd love for you to take that laser pointer, which is right here, and indicate your location on the world map. And let us know where you're joining us from today. This is always a very exciting time for us, this world map, because we'd love to see all of the different locations from where everybody is tuning in from during the live session. Love to see those in the United States, lots up in Canada and Australia. And wherever you're tuning in from today, we thank you and we're very grateful that you have joined us. It's a great question, Rich. You can also post your location in the chat here and let us know. And Paul, I think it's about 1 a.m., 1 or 2 a.m. for our Australia friends. So now we're going to move ahead and answer our polling questions. And you'll click on the green check or red X to vote. And are you familiar with the free technology UDL toolkit for all classrooms? And UDL stands for Universal Design for Learning. And if you are, please click the green check. And if you're not familiar with it, click the red X. I'll give everybody a few more seconds to vote. Green check yes, red check X. And let me post those results. And you can see that we have about 62% that are not familiar with this, with the toolkit, and about 26% that are familiar. Let me go ahead and close the, uh, clear the results. Let's go on to our second polling question. And do you work with students who have individualized education plans in your classroom, or known as IEPs? for their learning. If you have students that have IEPs in your classroom, please click the green check. And if you do not work with students that have IEPs, click the red X. And to vote just below the participants window. So let me go ahead and get those results. And it looks like we have about 20% that do that are not familiar and do not use um, have students with IEPs, and we have about 61% that do have students with IEPs. Let me go ahead and clear those results. And we'll go ahead to the last polling question. Are you familiar with the term UDL, Universal Design for Learning? If you're familiar with it, click the green check. And if you're not, click the red X. Let me go ahead and get those results. And it looks like 
are not familiar, and about 42% are, almost half and half. So this will be a great session for people to learn some more about UDL and assistive technology today. And right now, I'm going to pass it over to Peggy, who's going to introduce our very special guest today. Thank you, Kim. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We are so excited to have Karen Janowski with us as our special guest today. We all know the power of having a strong PLN, that's a personal learning network, where we can share our learning and ideas and ask for support when we need it. Well, Karen has been part of my PLN for a long time, and she is always the first person I think of when teachers ask me about UDL or assistive technology. Her hope by the end of today's session is to help all of us realize that UDL and assistive technology are not just for special education, but should be considered in all areas of education. Karen is an assistive and educational technology consultant with EdTech Solutions, and her passion is to remove the obstacles to learning for all students. Karen's also an adjunct professor at Simmons College, which is a private, non-sectarian undergraduate women's college in New England. And formerly, Karen was a school-based occupational therapist. So she brings tons of experience to this topic. So I want to say welcome to you, Karen. And I'm going to turn the mic over to you to begin your presentation. Presentation. Our newbie question, which is coming up, is uh, what is assistive technology in UDL? And Karen's going to address that newbie question as she goes through her presentation. So we hope you'll ask your questions in the chat as we go along. And we'll ask them on the mic at the end of the session for Karen. And you might also want to take the mic at the end to ask your question once she's finished her presentation. So thanks, Kim, or Karen, take it away. Thank you, Peggy and Kim. This is really exciting to me to be here. Um, there is one more thing that I do. I also work part-time three days a week in the Newton Public Schools here in Newton, Massachusetts, which happens to be one of the largest um, districts other than you know the big cities in, the, in Massachusetts. So that, this is the second year that I'm doing that. So I'm in a lot of classrooms, and I see a lot of struggling learners. How, I guess one of my other questions would be, I noticed um, several of you don't work with students with IPs, but how many of you work with kids who are struggling learners? And I would imagine that would cover everyone. Because you know, the struggling learners could be the gifted kids who are bored. It can be a variety of things. So our session today is going to look at how we can reach all learners. So where do we begin? How do we begin? I think it's really important to talk about first, before I even define assistive technology, I want you to think in a new way about where is the disability. We typically think of our students as the ones having the dis disability. But I would love you to think about the curricular materials that we choose if they are, in fact, the disability for our kids. So paper, think of paper. Now, where is the disability for this student? How old do you think the student is? What grade? Kindergarten, first grade, fourth, second, OK, sixth. Lori, you're the closest. Brian, sixth as well. This student is a fifth grader. Using a graphic paper-based graphic organizer, how does he read his own writing? You know, picture this. Picture students, you know, how many times we give students an assignment to create note cards that they are supposed to study from. Well, if a fifth grader is writing like this, how can they um, review their own note cards for study? So always think about the curriculum materials that you're using. Are they, in fact, the disability? This is a great quote that one of my professors years ago um, taught me, and I have never forgotten it. Spelling is the spoiler of thought. And when we use paper-based materials, we don't 
we aren't giving students who have spelling issues any type of forgiving material. Computers take that away. So now, see, there is a tool for that. There's a tool for everything that we see in our classrooms. So now, just giving that as a background, let me just quickly show you the federal definition for assistive technology. Um, uh, is, the, is this keeping up? Somebody said they can't see the slides. Can, can people see the slides? OK, great. So any piece of equipment, any piece that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of someone with disabilities. So think about that. We are thinking about anything that is used to increase, maintain, or improve. So there's pretty much nothing that is not covered by that definition. So we often talk about pencil grips. We talk about slant boards. We talk about um, specialized paper, all kinds of things. Just about anything can be considered assistive technology if it, in fact, improves, maintains, or increases the, the abilities of someone with disabilities. One thing that that um, AT is not is a scribe in the classroom. And so I want you to be thinking of new ways, based on some of the things that we're going to be going over today, new possibilities other than having those students have to depend on an adult scribe to help them. So assistive technology actually does cover a variety of areas. Um, but today, we are going to focus on learning, assistive technology for learning and curriculum support. And I hope that this um, session today will cause you to reflect on your own practices. So think about what you are currently doing. And think about, is it working? So when I work with teams and when I go into classrooms, I always look around to see what is that classroom teacher currently doing, and is it working? Is it working? And we can all have a long discussion about how we define, is it working? Some people would say, oh, yes, you know, we've got an Alpha Smart available. We've got computers available. We've got word prediction software available. But no one knows what, what to do with those. Or they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, when, when the student can't read, we read it to them. Well, I would question, is that really working? Is what we're doing is making kids dependent on adults. And what our point is, what our mission is as educators is to help instill a love for learning and promote independence for all kids. So why do we want to concentrate on the use of assistive technology? You've seen your kindergarten students enter the classrooms looking like this. By middle school, I mean by elementary school, oftentimes they may look like this. By high school, they may look like this. Very discouraged. Where is that joyful learning that they had when they were kindergartners and first graders? And struggling learners are frustrated. And so what we want to do is avoid this type of image in our classrooms. We really want to help our kids to feel successful as learners, not learn passivity, not learn learned helplessness, but really feel successful and independent. And I love this quote, because so many of the struggling learners that I work with really struggle with reading. And in fact, my own son was on an IEP all through school. He had a language-based learning disability. And when he graduated from high school, he said that he would never read a book again, which kills me as, as an educator and kills me as his mother. And so that's part of where my mission comes from and my passion. I don't want any other kid to graduate from high school believing that they will never be successful as a reader. So with assistive technology, what it does is I, mean, I am tunnel vision. I see every day how the use of assistive technology removes the obstacles to success. 
it helps students, it, it gives students new ways and alternative ways to demonstrate learning. So let's talk about that for a minute. How many times do we use paper worksheets in our classroom as, as a standard way to demonstrate um, learning? I see it all the time. Uh, I see I see worksheets used constantly in classrooms. Now let's think about paper-based materials for a minute. Another phrase I'd love for you to think about is, oh good, Stephanie, very little do you see the, um, the worksheets. That's great. Um, but think about the materials that, that you do use. Think about are they mistake tolerant or are they mistake intolerant? And when I use that term, mistake tolerant, picture that you're building something with clay and you make a mistake with it. What do you do? You just smush it and you start all over again. Now, it's, mistake, it's a mistake tolerant medium. Now, picture when you use, when you sculpt with stone and you make a mistake. What do you do? OK, you start over, you chip away some more. And eventually, if you make too many mistakes, you're left with just a small stone. That is an example of a mistake intolerant medium. So in your classroom, are you using tools that are mistake tolerant? Or are you using tools that are mistake intolerant? Many times I'm in classrooms, especially at the younger grade levels, and kids will have erased so many times on their papers that they'll have erased a hole right into the paper. Have you seen that too? That's an example of a tool that is mistake intolerant. So computers, word processors, they are examples of tools that are mistake tolerant. So assistive technology gives, provides new ways, oops, I went too far, provides two new ways to demonstrate learning. And for many students, it makes learning possible promotes independence. This is huge. Uh, I know in the districts around here in Massachusetts, very often when students are struggling, whether it's because they are, have reading disabilities or they can't read their own writing or they're on the autism spectrum, very often in Massachusetts we assign a paraprofessional or, be, or um, a, an inclusion assistant to the student. I don't know how that is in other parts of the country, but in this area, that is oftentimes what parents um, and special educators will offer. What that does is it keeps kids dependent on adults. Assistive technology promotes independence. So this, that's why I am such a firm believer on the use of technology to unlock um, the obstacles to learning and to help kids demonstrate knowledge in new ways. It really does open new doors. Are there any questions that I'm missing so far? Because um, I can't multitask. Can I, I haven't really seen any, Karen. Mainly just chat okay. about what you're in comments. Okay, cool. So go right ahead and continue. OK, great. Thanks. So some guiding principles just to, go, just to um, give you some background and to think about as you have school next week. Here in Massachusetts, we're actually, we have what's called February vacation. So we don't have school next week at all. We've got a break. But for those of you who aren't in Massachusetts, if you do have school, I hope you'll think about some of these guiding principles. One of the um, most important principles when we consider what type of technology to use with a student is we use what's called the SET framework. And SET stands for student, environment, ta tasks, and technology. And so the S for student, so what does that mean? What are the student's strengths? What are their areas to strengthen? What are their interests? How are they currently learning? So we look at that information. The E stands for their environment. What is already available for them in their classroom setting? What do they already have? Um, what's the teacher, teaching style? What, you know, what do the, what's the teacher expectations? Then we look to see what the tasks are. What are they required to do to demonstrate knowledge in that classroom? And then finally, we come up with the final T, which is technology, which, which are the recommendations that we think about. I've also added two additional T's to the SEP framework because I really believe we need to trial 
whatever it is we are recommending to see if it does in fact work. And then also we need to train people because how many times, you know, availability of the software or availability of the hardware doesn't mean that it's being used effectively. So the final additional T's are training and trials. Another guiding principle is it's a team process. It's a team approach. Everyone gets together and collaborates together and sees, you know, what is in the what will help that struggling learner to be successful. It's a process as well where it can be the process can be um, considering the whole technology co continuum. Is it low tech? Is it mid tech? Is it high tech? And a low tech tool could be something as simple as giving um, a student a ruler to help them guide as they read along. Or it could be something as simple as using a pencil grip to help them when they are reading, when they are writing. So it is a, uh, it is a process and a continuum. I'm so glad, I'm glad Brian's in, Brian Friedlander is in the uh, chat room because he's one of my colleagues who I've learned a great deal from. And he can answer some of those questions too. So tool belt theory, you've heard Iris Sokol here in, in Classroom 2 I know he was here a month or two ago. And one, again, one of the guiding principles is tool belt theory. And Google him, somebody can put that, chat, um, that link in the chat room. What Ira proposes is it is our responsibility as educators to demonstrate and show, well, to show our students the vast array of technology tools that can help them be independent in the long run. When I walk into, uh, when, when you're at meetings, do you bring a laptop to take notes or do you handwrite notes? In that type of situation, everyone uses their own, the technology that works for them. Some people use paper and pencil. Some people use um, a port, you know, their iPhones to, to text them to them um, to text notes to themselves. Some people take notes on their iPads. Others use use um, laptops. We use the tool that works for us in that situation. Are we also promoting tool use, a variety of tools, with our struggling learners? That would be something that I would challenge you to think about. Do we only give our kids one way, one method to demonstrate knowledge? One way to, to complete whatever the, the activity is. We need to show them the, um, the possibilities as well and use tool belt theory. So definitely um, Google Ira's tool belt theory blog post and because he says it so eloquently. I love to learn from Ira as well. Oh good, yeah, Brian put in the, his, Brian if you can find that particular link that would be great and drop that in as well. Another guiding principle is universal design for learning and I did notice many of you don't know what UDL is and someone asked if it did come from the field of architecture and that's where it did start. So think back to the 70s and 80s when there started to be curb cuts put into the, our sidewalks. Who benefited initially from the use of curb cuts in sidewalks? Initially it was people using wheelchairs, but over time everyone benefits. Picture you're pushing your child in a stroller or you're rollerblading or, you know, curb cuts benefit everyone. The think about levered door handles. They were originally put in place using universal design to help people with um, arthritis to be able to open a door more independently. But again, who benefits from using a levered door handle? Have you ever had to use one with your elbow? You know, I've had my hands full carrying groceries or bags or when my kids were younger carrying a child in my arms and I would open the door with my elbow. So we all benefit. Universal design for learning is is an offshoot and evolved from that field of architecture where what we put in place for our kids with disabilities actually um, actually benefits all students. 
and it is. Ba I thought more people would know about UDL, so I didn't really put any more slides um, about Universal Design for Learning in the uh, slideshow. But if you go to the cast.org website, that's a great. That will take you. That that is, you can spend days there. But the important thing to know about UDL is it's proactive. It's embedded which to me is different from differentiated instruction, which you think about more after the fact. UDL is proactive. It's embedded. It offers, and it covers three main areas. It offers multiple methods of engaging students. It offers multiple methods of presenting the material to students. And it offers multiple methods of expressing your knowledge. So it's really three areas, multiple methods of presentation, engagement, and expression. And when you, you embed UDL principles into your classroom, you really are now able to reach all learners in your classroom. So that's another huge guiding principle for me. So let's look at a few examples. One of the things, here are some low-tech examples that can work that are, these are um, just the erasable highlighters, which I think are very cool, this right here, uh, they are an example of a mistake-tolerant medium. How many times, those of you who teach highlighting to your students, and you'll find especially like fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, they don't know what's important. They'll highlight everything. But when you use erasable highlighters, you can teach the, the importance of, of, of helping determine saliency and what's the most important information when you use an erasable highlighter. You can also teach it effectively if you use computers because, and you go into a word processing document and you use the, um, the highlighting tool right within Microsoft Word or, or Pages or whatever. So though that's an example of some low-tech ideas. Dragon Naturally Speaking is an example of a more high-tech idea. And um, are any, do any of you use, personally use, Dragon Naturally Speaking speech recognition software? A few of you do. Great. Now, have you also shown, oh yeah, yeah, Peggy, it is. Dragon Dictation on your iPhone and your iPad is fantastic. And again, that's an example of a tip or a trick that we need to show our students. How many of our kids have eye touches that they bring to school? Have we shown them the Dragon Dictation app? It really is powerful. We can't keep that kind of knowledge to ourselves. We have to share it with, with our students as well. I just have to reach for something. Um, so that's a great example of an AT tip or trick and again, Dragon Dictation was originally a product created for people with physical disabilities who could not control a computer. And boy, has it evolved since then. It used to be, I think, like fifty or $80,000. Now we can get it free on our iTouches, our iPhones, our mobile devices. It is, um, it's fantastic. Another. Uh, another example that I want to talk about, too, is anything that is digital is now accessible. So another really important example that I hope all of you take from this session today is the ability to use free text-to-speech and add it to every computer that your students use. So on the Mac, in the Mac, under System Preferences, if you go to System Preferences Speech and you click on the tab that says Speak Selected Text and create a shortcut key, every time text is highlighted and you hit that shortcut key, students can hear what they've either written or what they're um, accessing on the internet or in, in a Word document. They can hear it read back to them. It's really powerful. Uh, it's, it's one of the best kept secrets, and we can't keep it a secret any longer. Because that alone helps so many of our struggling learners in their classrooms. When we offer text to speech, we abs I mean, when we offer digital materials, we are now making the curriculum accessible to kids, 
and we are giving them the opportunity to use text-to-speech. It's free on the Mac. We'll be um, exploring the UDL Text Toolkit, and there are a number of free, um, free, free links to tools that are um, that work on the PC as well. Oh, somebody's got their hand raised. Lenny, how do we uh, make sure Lenny, Len, eight? Oh, who's got their hand raised? Lynn, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Is there a question? Lynn, you click on the mic button in the bottom left. What about a PC environment? Our school district is PC. Len, it's a great question, and the UDL Tech Toolkit Wiki that we will be um, exploring in a minute has many links to free UDL, uh, free um, text-to-speech tools. One of the ones, if you, if the districts that I work in still are using Word 2003, uh, which is great because there's really no reason to go to 07 or or, or 10, but with Word 2003 running XP, you can uh, free, a great free tool is called Word Talk. And it is tremendous because it offers free text to speech and it highlights every word as it reads it. And it offers free, um, a free talking thesaurus and a, and a built in um, talking spell checker. It is phenomenal if you're, if you're using um, a PC environment. It's called Word Talk, and it's a link on the free UDL Tech Toolkit wiki. Another, uh, another example, just before we go on and explore that area. Oh, thank you, Lynn. Yep, you've got it. That's the link. Another example, has, does anyone recognize this particular interface? Do you know what this particular software program is? Beverly, yep. It's it's um, it's made by the same company that makes Clicker. It is called Write Online, and it is a commercial product. But there are a couple of things I'd love for you to notice about this. One of them, you'll see the word prediction window. And so I just started typing PR, and President is the very first word that shows up. And then now. Why, the, the point I want to make about word prediction is we've got a lot of kids who, who can't spell well. And so they've given up on using words that they know, but they will not write them because they do not know how to spell them. And at the beginning, I talked about how spelling is the spoiler of thought. And a tool like word prediction does help overcome that particular um, issue. The other thing you'll notice at the bottom is there are some word banks and sentence starters. So again, some of our kids can benefit from this kind of external support. I see Maureen talk, has a question here about the question of fairness. Um, some do not believe that we should offer other tools, but somehow make them learn how to do things more traditionally. It's such a, a, a great question. Um, what is fair? And Rick Lavoie said, once, and I, I hope I can remember his definition. Fair doesn't mean giving everyone the same thing. Fair means giving everyone what they need. And I think that is what we have to keep in mind, giving everyone what they need. So and you know what's, what's ironic, too, is very often the teachers who bring up those points about fairness are wearing reading glasses. and so. One of the things you can suggest to them is, OK, let me take away your reading glasses. OK, good. And you give them a book in front of them. And then you say, OK, now read this. And it makes the point quite clearly that we use the tools that we need. And that might be something, um, yeah, Fat City Workshop. It's uh, 
So think of Rick Lavoie's line. It doesn't mean giving everyone the same thing. It does, give me, it does mean giving everyone what they need. And isn't our point as educators to help our kids feel successful and to have a love for learning? And if we are making them use methods that, that leave them discouraged, that leave them feeling unsuccessful, what are we doing? I do, I, I, this is when my passion comes through because I say we've got to do whatever it takes to help every student succeed. And the traditional methods work for some kids, but they don't work for many of our kids. And so we've got to offer them new alternatives. The iPad is another device that does offer kids new alternatives. The, um, the ability to read on the device and to change the size. There's going to be a new app that's coming out um, that's called out, going to be by a company called Bookshare. And for your students who have print disabilities, they can get free copyrighted text from Bookshare when they have um, a print disability. Bookshare is also coming out with an app that will read text-to-speech. We've all been dying for this. It's coming, um, it'll be about $20. There are other apps similar to the LiveScribe Smart Pen that work on the iPad. One is called SoundNote and AudioNote that will connect um, a, 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 a recorded voice to the notes that are being taken so that students can review their notes at a later time. How many times we, we, I, uh, do we write repetition and review, previewing, reviewing in an IEP as an allowable accommodation? This so sound note and audio note and the smart pen allow kids to get that preview and the review when they need to hear the information over again. It doesn't make them dependent on an adult reviewing the information with them. They are now independent. That's another tool we have to show our students. There's many more things that I can say about the iPad, um, but I really want to get into the UDL Tech Toolkit Wiki. And what I want to do is just take you on a quick tour. Um, so we're going to, um, I'm going to go to the UDL Tech Toolkit Wiki. And then I think here, if you, you probably already are exploring it. But here is where we can really find a, a wealth of tools that are all free. And if you notice, there are free text-to-speech tools, free writing tools, free research tools, free study skills, literacy tools, graphic organizer. There is a page that explains about universal design for learning. There's free collaborative tools. And then there's some additional free tools, math tools, additional strategies. So if one of the, um, so if I take you to the free text-to-speech tool, page. Um, can you see what, actually, I don't, I don't know anymore what you see. Um, I'm not Karen, sure. Karen, be sure to click on tour guide so we follow you when you click on something. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, no, it, it, it is, yeah, it is selected, but it took me to a new window, so you did lose that. Okay. Try well, it once I more. I will just let you all explore it. Well, you know, I unfortunately had to use, um, Internet Explorer, I don't know if that makes a okay. difference, because Firefox was so slow for me today. I'll select Does that make a guide, difference? and you tell me what you'd like to uh, go to next. Let's see if that works. OK, well, I, OK, so let's do text-to-speech. OK. OK. Yes, that brought up a web tour side trip for me also. Yes, OK. So let's just have people click on what you're describing, and they'll all be able to see all it right. in a pop-up window. So we window. can't do it within the, that screen. That's OK. Ourselves. So let's just have people click on what you're describing, and they'll all be able to see it in a pop-up window. Great. OK. So we can go to text-to-speech and explore. You can see. I mean, you might, you're might. you probably surprised to see how many options there are. I do try to keep updating this as I learn of new things. And I do want to thank Joyce Valenza, who's in the audience, who took a blog post that I wrote and created this 
um, wiki space, which is just tremendous. And I know many people are using this um, throughout the world. And, and I definitely have to thank Joyce for um, assembling it and creating it and, and making it a really uh, valuable tool that anyone can access easily. So you'll see there are a number of free tools here. Word Talk is the number one is the first one selected, and that is free for the PC. If we click on literacy tools, very often uh, I, I get questions about what can we do to help improve reading comprehension for students who are struggling readers. And one of the best tools at the elementary school level is listed here. It's the fourth one down. It's called Into the Book. It's an amazing reading comprehension resource. I highly recommend those of you who work with um, students who younger students who struggle with reading comprehension to look into using that tool. Um, there's many other tools here to use. Oh, good. Oh, good. You were able to get into it on the web tour. OK. I keep losing it, though. Um, so there's a kids section and there is a teacher section. And it's an interactive, really engaging, fun resource for students to use. That's another one that's great. If you, yep, you can log in. And they always say, first time here, you need a key. I, I never remember my keys, so I just get a key every time I log in. You know what, why don't we just go in there? I would love people to see this tool because it's so awesome. So we'll get the key. And can you do that? Pick, um, can people see that? I just don't want to get out of the, um, the window. Nothing's happening. OK, well, you'll have, you can do that on your own. Um, it's, it does work. And it's definitely something to explore over the weekend. If we now were to go into the writing tools, there are Google Scribe. If you haven't explored Google Scribe, that's a really cool tool. It's an autocomplete tool where you start typing, and it, and it com gives you some word suggestions. It, and it's free. It doesn't work as well for our kids who are struggling spellers because it can't. It's not. Um, it, it's not a contextual word prediction tool, which is what the commercial tools are. So if you're a lousy speller, it really doesn't know what you are trying to say. But it is good to know about for some of our students. Um, it can be just the answer for for some of the kids in your classroom, and it's also a good beginning place. Uh, the, again, oh, Paper Raider, those of you who work with high school students, one of the tools that's available is called Paper Raider. Has anyone used that? Pa PaperRaider.com, yes. It is, it is a, a great tool for high school kids. It, does, it helps kids. Oh, good, Joyce, you did. Yeah, I've been recommending it to the high, to um, to those I work with at high school. And actually, one of the teachers just said he is taking a course and he used it for his own paper. It does plagiarism detection for the student. It helps them with grammar checking, spell checking. It's it's free online proofreading. It's their own editor, and so before they have it, show it to their learning center teacher, it's a way for them to improve their word choice, their vocabulary. It gives them a lot of really nice feedback. Oh, I've seen if, um, yeah, I think students are really um, finding it valuable. I actually have my, had my daughter try it. She's a senior in college. And I asked her to try it, too. And she did say that it, it helped her you know, change some of the wording on um, the way that she had written some of her sentences. So highly recommend that. Free technology. Is it assistive technology? It's used to help increase, improve, or maintain the functional abilities of a student with disabilities. So that's assistive technology. It's free. Yeah, yeah Eva, it is great. It's so great. So we don't have a whole lot more time. And I do want to make sure that we do save time for questions. Uh, but I cannot recommend enough the opportunity to explore all of the resources 
depending on the students with whom you work. The multimedia and digital storytelling tools, the research, research tools, the study skills tools, there is so much available categorized that you can share with your um, colleagues. And then, you know, the whole point is think back to tool belt theory. When we know about these tools, we have a responsibility to show them to our students and let them develop their own tool belt. We've developed our own tool belts, our own toolkits. We've got to help our kids expand the tools that they can choose from. They are awesome. It's awesome what's available. There really has never been a better time to be an educator. Yes, all the tools on the UDL Tech Toolkit site are free. And I do, you know, I do keep adding things. And I do. Um, I, there's one. My web separation is under graphic organizers, and th from what I understand, it's going to go to a pay model in April. So, so there were there were more than half of you that didn't know about the UDL Tech Toolkit Wiki. Will you be sharing that with other people that you work with? Will you be, will you be sharing it with your colleagues? Excellent. And there are a number of you that um, didn't know about universal design for learning. So I hope that you're starting to get a better understanding about universal design. That's what motivated the development of this wiki was the fact that there are a number of free tools and the fact that we do need to make sure that the tools we're using in our classrooms are mistake tolerant and that they are accessible to all the learners in our classrooms. So, uh, so that is um, that's some information about the UDL Tech Toolkit. I think what I'm going to I, let me see what else I have for slides. Oh yes, so we're going to go back out of the web tour and just talk a bit about just a few more final points. So I'm going to close the web tour. Data collection. So there was a question about fairness that Maureen brought up earlier. When we do the data collection, we know how our students are doing without using these free tools and or without using assistive technology. We've got our baseline. So introduce the tools. Get the kids the opportunity to try them out and then do a comparison and see, does the use of the tool make a difference? And very often it does. It's so important to do the data collection because the point is, in, that we want our kids to learn and we want them to be successful. So if these tools help them, and this is again a really important point because I talk with educators all the time and they, you know, that sometimes, sometimes they look at me walking into a classroom and they get over, you know, the, ah, I didn't do it. But I want people to understand that the use of technology tips and tools, this is not in addition to what they're already doing. This is what this is in place of what they are doing. So those worksheets that require a student to be dependent on an adult, and that takes a lot of time to create, you know, and all the and that lead to um, frustration. And sometimes in some classrooms there are behavior issues around the use of of paper and pe pencil tasks. This is not in addition to. This is in place of because it helps our kids succeed. It does take a mind shift, absolutely. So again, I cannot stress enough. Evaluate, reflect upon what you are currently doing, and think about, is it working? The whole point is we want our students to soar. We want them to feel successful and to soar. So I thank you all for being here today, and I hope that you did find this helpful. Is it a Thank you so much, Karen. And I saw a question, I'm not sure if you addressed it, ideas about tools for collecting data. Uh, great question. Tools for collecting data. Uh, the Sometimes it's as simple as taking a snapshot. Uh, I mean, it, it could be a 
one of the things that I do all the time is I compare, I review writing samples because a writing sample will reveal to me word choices, vocabulary, spelling, how they use lines, how they, the legibility, uh, any legibility issues. And then, and it doesn't mean I have to use any particular assistive technology, but I might just introduce a computer. So then I've got the word process document compared to the handwritten document. There's your data collection. So you've got a work sample there that you've done the data with. Another thing sometimes I use is there's a versions feature in Microsoft Word. So you can have a student create something without any teacher instruction, you know, whatever it is, a particular essay, assignment, whatever. And so the student will do it the way that they normally would. And without a graphic organizer, without any technology tools other than that they're using word processing. Save it as a version. Then do your instruction and then have the student edit their work, revise their work, save that as a version. Then let them use the spell check feature, the synonym support feature, the text to speech feature so they listen to what they're using, what they've written, and then save that version. So then you've got three different versions to compare it to right within Microsoft Word. That's your data collection. So again, the data looks at what, it, what do you want to collect the information around. That would depend. That would help you decide what um, data collection tools to use. Great, thank you. And somebody asked if there are tools. Um, these tools are they for other languages? Are they multilingual? Um, some of them are. Um, you know, like w one of. There's Google Translate as well, if anyone has ever used that. That's ama an amazing tool. But um, yeah, Susan also has ideas in math. There is a math link page. Um, but one of the, um, the graphic organ, I mean, a lot of the tools, it doesn't matter what language, what language you're using. So you could use the graphic organizing tools, Webspration, Bubble, Bubble Us, in any, any language. Um, I haven't really explored to make sure that every tool is available in every language because I honestly haven't had that need. Yes, yeah, Google Translate does definitely help with um, other languages. So maybe someone else is better equipped to answer that question. And are there any other questions that you would like to see asked? If you'd like to take the mic, we'll click on the hand on the, with the green up arrow, and we'll be happy to give you the mic, or you can continue to type them in the chat. Yeah, Jess has a question about a text-to-speech highlighting app for um, the iPod or iPad. What um, there isn't yet, Speak It, what Speak It, unless Brian, unless there's something new. I love Speak It. What it does is it scrolls, so it shows you line by line. It doesn't highlight every word, but it's really, uh, you know, it, it's a great beginning step. So you might want to look into Speak It for the iPod or the iPad. Great. Are there any other questions before we close out the session? <laughs> Great money sources. Um, money sources. Right now, your districts still have ARA stimulus funding. Um, this is the second year of, uh, of specially earmarked money for IDEA that the federal government um, sent to every district. And when, when districts were applying for this money, what the federal government told districts to spend it on, the very first thing that the federal government told the districts to spend it on was high quality assistive technology and the professional development to use it. So check back with your school district and see how they are using the IDEA era funding, yeah, ERA grant money. The other thing, too, is Donors Choose is another great way to um, try to get some of this assistive technology. But keep in mind, a lot of, this, um, a lot of the tools are free. 
Deb, I do have it written someplace. Um, uh, let me. I I can't, I'd have to look through my Digo account to see where it is. What the, where the federal um, stimulus guidelines were. Great, Karen. Why don't you do that? I can go ahead and close out the session, and then we'll continue to take questions afterward. Uh, we are mindful that our session is one hour, and if you do need to leave, that's that we understand. But if you can continue to stay on, everybody, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can continue to ask questions. We want to let everybody know that on February 26th, next Saturday, we will be having a session on live binders in the classroom with the live binder founders, Tina Schneider and Barbara Talent. And we're looking to include some additional people to supplement that. So that's going to be a great session on ways to use light binders in the classroom and the new collaboration feature um, in light binders. And these are some of our upcoming sessions. And you can see on March 12th, we're going to have Carol Bruce and her students. Yes, Dean is busy that day. He has his daughter's uh, softball game. But we were definitely collaborating with him and trying to schedule him with the two. And we want to let you know these are the interviews that Steve Hargadon has on February 22nd. He'll be talking with John C. Lee Brown on February 23rd. He'll be talking with Steve Willer. And on the 24th, back with Michael Horn and Heather Staker. And you'll be having some wonderful interviews. And we do hope that you will check those out. We want to let you know that once you exit the session today, a link will open in your browser. And we would love for you to complete the survey and tell us your information, your ideas about today's session, as well as future guests and future topics that you'd like to see for future shows that we're working on. In that survey, you can also request a professional development certificate. Just put input your name and address, email address, and we will Peggy will take care of that. Give us a few days to get the results from Illuminate, and then Peggy will email all of the surveys, the certificates out. If for some reason the certificate doesn't open in your browser, you can email us at live at classroom20.com. And on the survey, there are two areas. One area is to request the survey. And the bottom portion, where you input your name and so forth, that's to request information from Illuminate. So if you don't put your information, your email address, and your name in the survey part, in the certificate part, then we won't know that you wanted the certificate. So make sure that you put it um, in the first part of the certificate and not the part for alumni. Because we know some people have had difficulty um, requesting those certificates. So just wanted to make a reminder of that. We also have secured an iTunes U channel that Peggy helped us coordinate. And to access that channel directly in iTunes, you can go to tinyurl.com slash CR20Live iTunes U. Again, that's CR20Live iTunes U. And then that will open directly up into the iTunes U channel. You can subscribe to the chat log and the MP3 and the MP4 of each session and take this with you wherever you go. And we want to extend a very special thanks to Karen today, as well as to Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0 and Future of Education. And, to a, and he's also a variety of things that he has going on. And a very special thanks to each of you for contributing and sharing today, as well as to Illuminate and Learn Central for providing a forum for us to meet here each week. So now I'm going to take it and pass it back to Karen. 
And Paula, you have a question? Let me go ahead and give you the mic. And go ahead, wait. Take it away, Paula. Hi, Karen and everyone. Thanks for all the information. Um, I think that everybody should have that um, UDL tech toolkit uh, definitely marked as a favorite on their computer. And I was wondering um, if you have explored Spelling City yet. Um, I think a lot of people think that it's just a spelling site. And I use it a lot for vocabulary. I don't teach language arts anymore. I teach math and social studies. And they have, um, you know, you type in your list. It gives you sentences that you can play games with. And some of them have audio parts to them. And I really enjoy it for my kids who struggle with reading and learning new vocabulary words. Thanks, Paul. Yep, Spelling City is one of the tools listed on the um, UDL Tech Toolkit. And one of the things that's great about it, too, is you, some of our poor spellers, they could input their own word list. And it will not add an incorrectly spelled word, which is great. The other thing that's amazing about Spelling City is it puts the word into a sentence, puts it in context for kids. How amazing is that? It, uh, and it also will, will spell the word for them. It's really it's such a great tool. I'm glad that you um, have used it in the past and recommend it. There, there's really I, I've got a lot of my own personal favorites on the wiki, but it always depends on who your student is and what are their um, what are their needs. Regional spellings. Oh, Infomeister. Not sure about that one. I don't know. I've never had to test it in that way. So again, you know, there's always exceptions to every rule. So uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how to, to answer that. And Karen, are you presenting in the Boston North area in the future? Well, I'm actually going to be out in Chicago on Wednesday and Thursday at the ICE conference. I will be in, um, I'll be presenting, um, yes. I'll be presenting on iPads and special education through MassQ at the end of April, beginning of May. I'm also going to be doing a couple other things um, through the summer. So I do present. Deb, where, you know, send me a message and tell me where you are. MassQ is Mass C U E, Massachusetts Computer Using Educators. Yes. Oh, you're, okay, so you're close by. So, so my email address is. I'll just drop it in. You can send me an email, and we can follow it up. And Carrie asks, "What are, the, what about the speller that uses building? Anyone would call the site?" Um. Hmm. I don't know that one. If anybody has the answer, if you could type that in the chat, as well as everybody's Twitter name, feel free to type that as well in the chat. Are there any other questions that we haven't addressed or that I might have missed in the chat that you'd like to ask? Please click on the hand with the green arrow, or you can continue to type them in the chat before we let Karen go and everybody enjoy the rest of their weekend. It looks like the questions have come to um, a close. I'm going to go ahead and post in the link for the UDL Tech Kit again one more time. And just a reminder, if you could fill out the survey, everyone, and indicate your uh, suggestions for future topics and future guests. And Lynn Grow, is that um, Carolyn just posted a bit about that as she wrote on her blog. And this is uh, the live binders link. We hope that you'll bookmark it and continue to review the links that are shared each session, as well as you can 
you hear them on our archives and resources page. And all of these resources will be uh, posted, including the chat log, to our website later this weekend. Again, on the archives and resources page. And we do hope you'll check that out in the calendar on that page. That's some great resources. And you can also, as Deb mentioned, you can save the chat if you'd like to. You can go to File, Save, and click Chat Conversation and save it as a uh, PDF or a text, as well as the whiteboard slides if you like. Save the entire group. But we post the chat log as well as the MP3 and MP4 on our webpage for you as well. The chat conversation is not posted on the white miners, but it is posted on our website page at that link right there. And if we have it, it looks like the questions are winding down. Yes, it's an also posted uh, in iTunes view. So if you subscribe to that, you can get that chat log from each week that we have a session. And it looks like the questions are winding down. We've had a great session, and thank you again, Karen, for joining us today, and thanks to each of you. And we hope to see you next Saturday at the very same time when we talk about live binders. So have a great day, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Hopefully you're thawing out from the, the winter blizzards. I know we have down here and we're back up to like 80 degrees in San Antonio. So have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the time. And if you're off on Monday, enjoy the President's holiday. And we will see you next Saturday. Thank you.